Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome to Undergraduate Seminar. Uh, this is our last talk of the semester. It's been a talk long in preparation. Alex has been working on this for a long time. Alex Teeter is going to tell us about cipher surfaces and not genus. I'm super duper excited for this talk. Alex, take it away. All right, so hello everyone. I'm Alex, I'm a double major in CS and math, and today I'm gonna to be covering cipher surfaces and not genus, and let's get right into it. So we're gonna be building up to a useful invariant in knot theory, and this is the minimal genus of a knot K. And I'll go, I'll go more into what a knot invariant is later on, so don't worry if you don't understand what that is right now. We're gonna cover a lot of beautiful mathematics. We're gonna cover knot theory, Euler characteristic, and we're gonna cover topological surfaces as well. So these funky looking objects right here, we're gonna cover what these are and how they'll be useful to us. So very exciting stuff. And I hope you're excited as I am for this because I am very excited to talk about this stuff. So first of all, we should probably establish what knot theory even is because, well, it's what we're gonna be studying during this talk. So what is knot theory? Well, first we have to answer the question, what is a knot? So the, the formal definition is it's a projection of the unit circle. So the circle in the plane into 3D space. And the intuition behind this is it's a bit like if you took an extension cord, so it's extension cord where you can plug the ends into each other and you looped it around itself a little bit and maybe you add some crossings to it and it goes over and under itself. And then you connect the two ends back together. And that's what a mathematical knot is. It's a circle that's knotted through itself and then the ends are connected back together. And it's not, so it's important to note too, that it's not like a traditional knot. So you're probably used to knots in your shoelaces or maybe knots in your headphones that are kind of like this. Uh, these are not mathematical knots because the ends are not fixed to each other. So there isn't a lot, it, there isn't a lot of interesting topological things you can say about this. So knots, these are, are the knots we're gonna be talking about during this talk. Uh, knot theory is the study of these objects. And it's also a subfield of a field called topology. You may have heard of it or you may have not, but it's essentially a field of mathematics that studies the properties of spaces that are preserved under continuous transformations. So the common example is that the donut and the coffee cup are topologically equivalent because there is a continuous transformation between the two. And we'll go more into what that means later, but that's the intuition behind it. So when are two knots the same? So uh, one of the biggest questions in knot theory is, well, we want to classify the different knots, but to classify them, we first need a notion of whether two knots are different or whether two knots are the same. So we need a definition for whether two knots are going to be the same, first of all. And the definition we choose is actually very natural. We consider them up to ambient isotopy. So let's show some images right here. So here's the rigorous definition. Uh, this might be a little scary, so don't worry. The intuition behind this is you're taking the knot and you're deforming it continuously through 3D space into the other knot. And there's a couple of rules. You can't, first of all, you can't let the knot pass through itself. So if I have the trefoil knot right here, if I'm deforming this, I can't lift this crossing over so that I have something like maybe, so I have something like this. I can't do that. I cannot lift crossings over each other. So I'm not allowed to do that. You're also not allowed to shrink crossings to a point. So if I have a crossing right here, so for example, if I have a part where it crosses over right here, I'm not allowed to just shrink this into nothingness. So I'm not allowed to sort of do something like this where it just shrinks the knot into a point. You're not allowed to do that. You, It's just a continuous deformation of the knot through 3D space into the other knot. So that's sort of the intuition behind it. You, 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 you can just think you're sort of playing around with the knot yourself. And that, that's, that sort of gives the intuition for ambient isotopy. You're just playing around with the knot and you're trying to deform it into the other one in 3D space. And certain, if two knots are ambient isotopic, we call them equivalent. So these knots would be equivalent. But for example, these knots in right here, the unknot and the trefoil knot, these are known not to be equivalent. So there is no deformation that exists between the unknot and the trefoil knot. 
and knot diagrams. So we typically view a projection of the knot equipped with information about the knot's crossings instead of the actual knot in 3D space itself. So this is more of a technical point, but we usually view the knot projected down into 2D space. Like when I'm actually drawing out these knots, I'm not, this isn't act the actual knot in 3D space. This is just a 2D projection down onto the plane. Uh, but it's also a 2D projection equipped with the information about the crossings, because if you don't add in the crossing information, then you, you lose it just with a regular projection. Because when you project onto the 2D plane, well, none of the parts of the knot can cross over itself. So you just, you'd get something like this, and that's not very useful to us because there's no crossings and the, all the important information about the knots and the crossings. So we have to also give it the information about the crossings. So orientation and knot sum. So it's a common theme in mathematics that we typically create more complicated objects from simpler objects. I mean, whether you're taking the direct sum of vector spaces or groups, or just adding objects together to make new ones. Uh, knot theory is no exception. So we're going to define the knot sum here, and this will be an important notion for this presentation. Uh, we're going to do this a bit informally. So how we start with taking the knot sum is we pick an orientation along both knots. So you can intuitively think about the orientation as sort of a direction to move along. I'm just going to do that. So, so you pick a direction to move around each knot and that's your orientation. So for example, for this one, we would be moving around in this direction and the arrows on the knot just basically indicate what direction you're moving around in. So by convention, we usually use arrows to indicate some sort of orientation. So for example, this would be this knot's orientation and we're sort of just traveling around it. And we glue, connect them along a segment such that no new crossings are added. So what we would do, for example, in the case of the trefoil knot, if I wanted to sum the trefoil knot with the trefoil knot, like so. Let's see if I know how to draw this. If I want to sum these two, what I would do is I would delete part of an arc from both knots. And along these points created from our disconnection, we connect the two knots like, like so, and that's the knot sum. But we cannot add any new crossings and I'll, there'll be a visual to sort of show what this means on the next slide. So here's just sort of the definition we're using. It's a bit informal, but I don't have time to sort of go into the, the rigor. So here's the idea. So if we're taking the knots from these two knots, we would delete this arc, delete this arc, and then connect them along the deleted arc. But for example, the one on the right is not a valid knot sum. We're not allowed to add new crossings. And the reason is, is because we don't want an ambiguous knot sum definition. So if we're allowed to add new crossings, then we could get a ton of different knots from the knot sum. And we don't want that. We want a more well-defined definition. So it turns out, actually, we still don't exactly, this still isn't exactly well-defined. And it's because it has to do with, so what knot you get from the knot sum actually has to do with the orientation you give the knots. So if the orientation agrees on both of their arcs, then you get one sum. And if the orientation disagrees, then you get a different sum. But there is a class of knots, and I'm not going to really get into this that much, that will give you a, um, a well-defined knot sum. But don't worry too much about that right now. It's not super important to the presentation. Right, so we can add knots. So it's also natural to think, okay, which knots can be expressed as the sum of two non-trivial knots and which ones cannot? So no, no pun intended. So when you, for example, you can sort of see the knot on the right here is actually just the sum of two trefoil knots. If I were to draw this out right here, have something like this. Now, if we sum them, if we delete the arcs and we connect them, get something like this. And you can sort of see how these, this is the sum of two trefoils. And it all also happens that every knot is the sum of itself with the on, a knot. So we have to include the non-trivial part of the definition here. And when I say non-trivial, I just mean it can't be the unknot because every knot is the sum of itself with the unknot. Because you can you can sort of see you can just shrink this unknot back into the arc right here. You can deform it back into the arc. So 
every knot is the sum of itself the unknot. But there are still, we still have a notion of composite knots, which are knots that are a sum of two non-trivial knots and prime knots, which are not the sum of two non-trivial knots. And you can think of these as just being analogous to the prime and composite integers. So composite integers, for example, six is the product of three and two, but five is not the product of any numbers that aren't, isn't one in itself. So you can think of these as being analogous. Like a lot of you might have, or some of you might have noticed that there, there's a problem, there's a problem with this definition. What if the unknot is a composite knot? Then we'd be the so oh, oh no, right? Oh no, oh no. What if what if the unknot's composite? That's not good because that means every knot is composite, because every knot is the sum of itself with the unknot. And if the unknot is the sum of two non-trivial knots, then every knot is the sum of two non-trivial knots. So that's not good. But we will prove this. We will prove this isn't the case using surfaces. So do not be alarmed. We will we will absolve ourselves. And finally, not invariance. So obviously, you know uh, from the previous parts that we want to tell knots apart. So we need to develop tools to do this. It's really, it's simple to tell if two knots are equivalent, just find an isotopy between them. But how do we know if two knots aren't equivalent? I mean, you could play around with the knot all you want. You could play around with it for five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but and you could maybe convince yourself that one can't be deformed into the other, but this still doesn't prove that they can't be deformed into the other. You could spend five more minutes trying to do this and well, maybe one could be deformed into the other, but in a really complicated way. So we need another way in showing that two knots are not the same. And developing knot invariants is how we do this. So you can just think of a knot invariant as a property that is preserved under ambient isotopy. So if two knots are equivalent, so for example, if we have something like this and the unknot, well, because these can be deformed into each other, they must have the same knot invariance. But if two knots have different knot invariance, then they can't be the same. They must be different because knot invariants are supposed to be preserved under ambient isotope. So that's the main idea. These are basically properties of the knots that allow us to distinguish between the knots. So we can sort of sort them into baskets. For example, there's tricolorability, which is a property of a knot to be colored uh, in a certain way. And we see with the trefoil knot, it can be tricolored. So tricolorability just means you can color it at every arc, either three colors meet or one color meets, and you have to color it with three colors. And we see we can do this with the trefoil knot, but not with the unknot. So they cannot be the same. You cannot deform the trefoil knot into the unknot. And we're going to be developing one of these knot invariants today. And we're, it's going to be called the minimal genus of a knot. So we'll be getting right into that. Uh, I'm making good time. So I, does anyone have any questions quickly? OK, so I'll go on. So we're going to take a huge detour here. We're going to be covering now Sorry. We're going to be covering now topological surfaces. So first, we're going to cover polyhedra. So Euler's identity is a really beautiful identity that relates the vertices. So vertices would be the one-dimensional points. The edges, so edges would be the two-dimensional lines between the points. And then the faces, which would be the three-dimensional uh, poly polygonal faces created by connecting these two. And it basically says that vertices minus edges plus faces equals two for every regular polyhedra. So we can verify this for the tetrahedra. For example, this is the most simplest case. We have that there is one, two, three, four vertices. So that'd be four. Edges, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's minus six. And if we count the faces, we have one, two, three, and then four. So plus four, we get two. So we see this holds. But it actually turns out that this formula holds for a much wider class of objects. And we're going to be investigating these objects. They're called topological surfaces. OK, so topological surfaces, we should define these because we want to know what they are and we want to analyze their properties. So we say a topological space sigma is a topological surface if for every point on the surface, there is an open neighborhood on the surface, such, such or open neighborhood in the space that can be there's a continuous transformation to a subset of the plane. 
Uh, and it also has to be house dwarf and second countable, but that's technical stuff that you don't really need to worry about. It's just so that's a nice space, basically. And you're already somewhat familiar with these because you live on one. The surface of the earth is indeed a topological surface because at every point in uh, on the earth, there's a neighborhood that looks like a plane. So locally, the earth looks flat. Globally, it's spherical. So topological surfaces are the same idea. So locally, they're flat, but globally, they could have different topological structure. And the same idea is sort of here. So every point, there's a subset or there's a neighborhood around that point that we can send to a subset of the plane. Great, so let's go over some examples. So the sphere is the most common example. And if you were a tiny person living on the sphere, you would think, oh, this looks flat, but it's actually not flat. It has a different topological structure. And you can just, so it's important to note that for these, they're not actually filled in. So the best way to think about this is it's like a beach ball. If you've ever been to the beach or a water park, the beach ball has the actual surface part on the outside, but inside it's not filled in at all, it's hollow. So next, the torus, another famous example. Uh, of a surface, uh, you can think of this as, I think it's best to think of this as like an inner tube at a water park. So, you know, inner tubes, the outside's all actually there, but inside it's just air, so it's hollow. So uh, you can think of it as like an inner tube going down a water slide. As it has a hole in it too, so that also makes it quantitatively different from the sphere, and we'll make this rigorous as we go on. And we can extend this concept to a two-hole torus, there's two holes. And we can do this for a three-hole torus. You can sort of think it kind of looks like a fidget spinner. <laughs> but yeah, and we can go on and on and on. OK, so homeomorphisms. So our notion of the same for surfaces is a little different than not, but it is similar. So we consider two surfaces, sigma 1 and sigma 2, homeomorphic if there is a bicontinuous bijection. So you can think of this as a map that Let's say we have points that are really close together in our pre-image. So let's call our pre-image sigma one. Sorry, I'll erase that. We call our pre-image sigma one. And we put this under the map phi. They're still going to be close together in the image. So we'll call this image sigma two. And this holds for the inverse as well. So if points are close together or connected in the image, they're also connected in the pre-image. So that's the intuition. It, it preserves the topological structure. So this is actually not the same as our equivalents for knots. And that's because there are certain surfaces that are homeomorphic, but you can't deform one into the other. So they're only equivalent up to a continuous transformation. There's no actual moving them through space. And I'll give you an example that sort of demonstrates this better, but the intuition is you can think of being able to take the surface apart and glue it back together so that all the parts of the surface are connected to itself in the same fashion. And yeah, as I stated, certain surfaces are homeomorphism equivalent, but not isotopy equivalent. So here's an example. So the standard torus and the knotted torus are homeomorphic equivalent, but you can't deform one into the other. So you could sort of think about how you could cut these up and then repaste. So you get all the stuff are still connected in the same way. And here's an example of just doing just that right there. And homeomorphisms preserve many of the properties we like in topology, and they will preserve the Euler characteristic, which will be really useful. And if you've taken a linear algebra or abstract algebra course, you can sort of think of them as the isomorphisms of topology. So they preserve the structure of our space. Now, you're probably thinking, oh, well, how do we generalize Euler's identity to surfaces? They don't really have edges or faces or vertices like a, a circle. Not, no, no edges. Where's the edges? Where's the faces? It's just one. There's nothing, there's nothing we can take there. So we need to triangulate our surfaces. So we divide our surfaces into triangular faces so we can compute the Euler characteristic. And here's the definition. So a triangulation is just a collection of triangles. And you can sort of just think it just covers the surface in triangles. And the triangles have to meet in a very specific way. So you can't have overlapping faces or edges that only intersect halfway. halfway. They have to intersect at at least one edge, one vertex, or nowhere. And this just sort of corresponds to your intuitive notion of what it would mean to split a surface into triangles. Right? You wouldn't want them overlapping because that wouldn't be good. You're just making, you're just putting triangles all over the surface so you can compute the Euler characteristic. 
we're not going to prove this, but it is preserved under homeomorphisms. So if a given triangulation on one surface has a given Euler characteristic, it will have the same Euler characteristic on the other surface. And same thing, it's also independent of the triangulation. So if I take one triangulation of the surface, it will give the same Euler characteristic as another triangulation. So it, it's independent of triangulation and that's really useful for us. So it's unambiguous. So it finally makes sense to give the following definition. So the Euler characteristic of a surface is just the Euler characteristic of any finite triangulation of that surface. So here's just some quick examples. So if we take a triangulation of the sphere here we, and we count up the vertices, edges, and faces, we see it goes to two. And now for the torus, I, and I'm sure some of you might notice here that we didn't exactly split it into vertices, faces, and edges here, but it actually turns out that you can divide the surface into anything that just splits it up into vertices, edges, and faces, and the Euler characteristic still comes out nice. And I guess the intuition is triangle is sort of homeomorphic or the same as uh, maybe uh, maybe I have like a re more rectangle partition of my surface or a rectangular shape or something like that. So uh, we're just going to go over some other notions really quickly. So compactness. So we say a topological space is compact if every collection of open sets can be made finite and still cover the space. Uh, but really the intuition is if I have a space and I'm covering it in saran wrap, well, I, this basically says I can always use finitely many much saran wrap. That, that's the intuition behind it. Uh, but there's a nice equivalence we have for surfaces anyways. So we're just going to use that definition. So we'll just say a surface is compact if it can be triangulated with a finite triangulation tau. So we'll use that definition. Uh, this is a well-known result. So we'll use this instead. So this is actually equivalent to compactness for surfaces, not for all topological spaces. And we will like to deal with compact surfaces because we can compute their Euler characteristic. And we want to use that as a powerful tool. So here's just a few examples. The, the sphere is compact, it has a finite triangulation, but you could think the infinite plane that just spans out goes on forever. There's, you can't triangulate this. You're going to end up using infinite triangles. So those are just two examples. And finally, orientability. So these orient non-orientable surfaces actually exist. Uh, I should explain what orientability is first. So in terms of surfaces, for example, the sphere, it has sort of an inside and an outside. So you can imagine there's one guy standing on the inside at the outside of the sphere, and there's one guy who's in the internal part of the sphere. But not all surfaces have the property where they have an inside and an outside, and these are non-orientable surfaces. So you can think of them as having different sides and we can actually make this rigorous. So if you took a tangent vector to the surface and don't worry if you don't know what that means, that just it's just an arrow that points out from the surface, we can always slide it around to get its negative tangent vector. So the tangent vector that's just opposite. And uh, the Mobius strip is one of the most fundamental examples. Uh, you, you can also think another way you can think of non-orientability is if I was trying to paint this the two sides of the surface using two colors, well, it wouldn't be possible because I would always end up using a single color. Because if I took a trip around here, I'd end up right back where I began. And every non-orientable surface contains a Mobius strip. I'm kind of arm waving here when I say this. What the rigorous version of this is that every non-orientable surface is some projective planes, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, it turns out uh, orientability is also preserved under homeomorphism. So this is well defined for our surface equivalence definition. And I'll just show you a weirder example really quickly. Uh, the Klein bottle is another example of a non-orientable surface. So it's a surface that only, it's also a surface that only exists in four dimensions. It always intersects itself in three dimensions. So you can't actually embed this surface in three dimensions. It's, you ha it has to be embedded properly in four dimensions. And these surfaces are pretty interesting, but I just thought I'd bring, bring them up because we actually want to avoid non-orientability. We want orientable surfaces for our purposes. So we can see if I took a tangent vector on the Klein bottle, it has the same property. We can go up and we get the opposite tangent vector. And we can also see it contains a Mobius strip in it, as I stated. It's actually the uh, it's actually 
two Moby strips glued together. Uh, and finally, surfaces with boundary. So you can just think of a surface with boundary as a surf something homeomorphic to a surface without boundary with D disks removed. So you can think of this as like a donut I took, or a hollow donut, I took two bites out of it. So there's two boundary components now. And for example, uh, a disk, so a disk would be a sphere with a single boundary component. And the boundary component is kind of this curve that bounds it in. And you can always convert these back to something homeomorphic to a surface without boundary by just gluing in disks. Sometimes this gluing requires four dimensions, but we can always do this. So we can always get back something that doesn't have boundary. And something to note, if we add in D boundary components, we decrease the Euler characteristic by D because it removes a phase homeomorphic to a triangle. So we think if we have a triangulation and we remove a boundary component, well, it's kind of like removing a triangle from our triangulations that removes a face. So the vertices minus edges plus faces uh, goes down by one. And we'll be investigating surfaces with boundaries. So we want to have this notion. Okay, so it actually turns out we know all the surfaces, we know all the compact orientable surfaces up to homeomorphism. And this theorem gives this classification to us. So the classification theorem for compact orientable surfaces says that every compact orientable surface without boundary sigma is homeomorphic to a sphere with G handles attached. And we're gonna call the amount of handles attached the genus of the surface. And by convention, if we have a surface with boundary, we will denote the genus of that surface as the genus we get from capping the surface off with disks. So we can cap it off with disk to get something without boundary. And what do we mean when we say handles attached? Well, it means that every compact orientable surface can be obtained from this process. So we're gonna take a sphere and we're gonna remove two disks from it. And then we're gonna attach a cylindrical handle H. And don't worry, there will be a visual on the next slide to illustrate what this means. So here we go. So here's sort of the idea. So you take off these two disks from our sphere and then you associate the boundary points on the cylindrical handle to the points on the sphere. And this sort of gives you a gluing process that attaches the handle to the sphere like, like so. And we can actually sort of sort, our, you can think we're, we can sort our surfaces into baskets this way. So we have the baskets of things that have zero handles and these are just spheres. And we have the baskets of things that have one handle and these would be our torus. So these would be our torus surface. And then we would have our basket for surfaces with two, two handles and these would just be our double torus and so on and so forth. And we're not going to prove the classification theorem because we'd be all here all day if we tried to do that. But what I will do is I'm going to prove this quality. So for a given compact orientable surface sigma, we have that the Euler characteristic is equal to 2 minus 2g, two where g is the, no the genus or the number of handles. And this is great because this allows us to immediately know, OK, if I know the Euler characteristic, I can sort it into this basket. So that's amazing. So we're going to prove this by induction. The base case is when we have zero handles. Well, if we know if we have zero handles, that's just a sphere. And we've already established for anything homeomorphic to the sphere, it must have Euler characteristic two. So the Euler characteristic is equal to two. And we also know we're using zero handles. We have two minus two G, that's two minus two zero, which is equal to two. That proves the base case. That's pretty, that's pretty easy. Now we're gonna go on to our inductive steps. We're going to assume we have some surface sigma and it has G handles attached already. So we have the, the Euler characteristic is equal to 2 minus 2G. That's our inductive hypothesis. So I'll just note down inductive hypothesis. And we want to prove that if we glue on another handle, giving us a surface sigma prime with G plus one handles, then we get this equality. Let's do that. So suppose we do, suppose we attach another handle. So we have to remove two disks this will lower the Euler characteristic by two, as we've just stated. And a handle is just a cylinder. It's a sphere with two boundary components. So if we remove two boundary components from the sphere, the Euler characteristic goes down by two. So the handle just has Euler characteristic zero. And sigma prime is just sigma with the handle attached. So we have that the Euler characteristic of sigma prime is just equal to this. And by the induction hypothesis, this is just equal to two minus two G. This goes to zero and this is negative two. 
So we get the equality we wanted. So great. So that's really cool. So this is fantastic because this means if we know the Euler characteristic, then we know which basket it goes into. So every surface is determined by its Euler characteristic and the amount of boundary components. And if we know we, it has boundary components, we can just cap them off with disks and get something, get a surface without boundary. So this is great. So I'll give you an example of how powerful this is. So let's, let's look at this really pathological, weird looking surface right here. Well, if you were to triangulate it and compute its Euler characteristic, we would get negative one. And if we use our identity, the Euler characteristic is equal to two minus two G, and we cap off this one boundary component right here that sort of runs through the surface. Well, we would get that this simply has genus one because you would have, this is equal to negative one. Um, so we did, yeah, subtract two, that would give us negative one or you know, no, that would give us negative two, divide both sides, we'd get a surface of genus one. So in fact, using the classification theorem, we would get that this is basically just a torus with a disc removed. It's homeomorphic to a torus with a disc removed. So this really demonstrates how powerful the classification theorem is because no matter how pathological the surface we have, how pathological it is, we can always tell, okay, which basket it goes into just by the Euler characteristic and the, its amount of boundary components. Okay, finally, back to knot theory. We detoured for a while, so let's get back to knot theory. So it would be really nice if we could associate a surface to every knot. So if we could have every knot bound a surface. Um, and we could try a naive approach of just filling in the space in between the knot and itself. But the issue is if we do this for the trefoil knot, we get a non-orientable surface. This is actually homeomorphic to a Mobius strip. So if you took a trip around this, you would end up right back where you started. It's one-sided and we don't want that because we want to be able to define the genus unambiguously. So we need an algorithm to give us our non -ori our, our orientable surface and Seyfert's algorithm comes to the rescue. So for every knot, there is an orientable compact surface that is bounded by the knot. So let's go through the algorithm and how it works. So we pick an orientation and this is just our direction of travel. So this is sort of what we did when we took the knot sum. So remember, we just pick a direction to go around the knot. Ooh, right there. And we smooth out each crossing as we come across it. So we would assign to each crossing an in and out for each part of the crossing. And then we assign the opposite in to the opposite out, like so. So B get in gets assigned to A out and A in would get assigned to B out. And one second, right? So we'd, we'd smooth them out in this way and we would get, okay, sorry, let me go back. So doing this, we would get disks. So we get, these are called our safer circles. So as we can see, if we do this process for the trefoil, we get two safer circles. But this is a disconnected surface, that, and that's not good. We don't want it to be disconnected. We want it to be connected, and we want it to be bounded by the knot. So how you accomplish this is that at every crossing you removed, you attach a band with a half twist. And this gives you the safer surface. And the process is shown in three dimensions here, if that makes things a bit more clear. Okay, right there. So we have a compact orientable surface bounded by the knot. So it's easy to see that the surface is compact because each of the components was finitely triangulable. So the whole thing must be finitely triangulable, but how do we know it's orientable? Well, it turns out we can actually just take the induced orientation from our knot. So when we smooth out the crossing, we have one orientation here and one orientation there. So we take this to be the clockwise orientation and the counterclockwise orientation. And then you could think you could use this orientation to color in each part of the surface. And with our bands, with our bands with half twists, these allow us to have a consistent orientation because you could go from here, this is one side, here to the other side and then vice versa. Yeah. So here's some more examples. So here's just our, our trefoil safer surface and it doesn't really look much like it's bounded by the safe the trefoil knot so usually you have to isotope these to make it more clear that it's bounded by the knot and here's another example uh, of doing it for the figure eight knot so you'd go around here and you'd smooth it out so you'd smooth out the crossings each time and you would attach bands everywhere you smoothed out a crossing 
and here's a various sacred surfaces for various knots. They look, I think they look very cool personally. Okay, so the minimal genus. So we may be tempted now to define the genus of a knot K as the genus of the sacred surface it bounds. But uh, there's a problem here. So the issue is, Seyfert's algorithm is not guaranteed to give the only compact orientable surface a knot could bound. So a knot could bound multiple different surfaces of different genuses. And the unknot, so just our circle, is probably the, the most common example of this because it bounds a disk, but we can also see it bounds a one-hole torus. And it also bounds a two-hole torus like that. And that's not good. Oh no, that is not good. That's really bad because this means our definition is ambiguous. So we're going to take the following definition instead. We're going to define the genus of a knot as the minimum of the genuses of any safer surface it bounds. And I'm not going to prove this, but this is preserved under ambient isotopy. But the intuition is if I'm ambient isotoping one knot into the other, I'm not going to disconnect the surface it bounds. So the surfaces that it bounds should at least be homeomorphic. Okay, well, that's great, but now it's really difficult to compute because we can't take advantage of Seyfert's algorithm because we don't know that we're gonna get the minimal genus Seyfert surface from that. Well, the following theorem comes to our rescue here, and this is a really nice theorem. So performing Seyfert's algorithm on an alternating projection of a knot will give the minimal genus Seyfert surface. And an alternating projection is just a projection where if you travel along the knot, the crossing, so the part where the knot crosses itself, go over, under, over, under, over in an alternating fashion. And the, our projections of the trefoil and the figure A knot actually end up being alternating. So that's great. So we already know the, we already know the state minimal genus Seyfert surface of the trefoil and the figure eight knot. And a lot of knots actually are alternating. Um, there's a wide class of knots that are alternating. So we're gonna actually use our uh, invariant. So we're gonna compute, we're gonna first consider our construction of the trefoil knot. So we use two disks and each disk has other characteristic one. And we also attached three bands along the boundaries of these disks. We had disks and we attached three bands with half twists, sort of like this. I'm really bad at drawing my computer. Something like this. And we had three bands. I'm, yeah, this is not great, but we attached three bands along the boundaries of these disks. And we added a face because each band is just, you can think it's its own face. And we added two edges every time we do this because we have the edge that connects the disk to the band on the bottom and top. And because we decrease, so because we increase by one for the face and subtract two for the edges, we go down by one for each band. So the Euler characteristic of our surface must be negative one. Um, vertices, yeah, yeah. And we know the surface by construction has one boundary component, the trefoil. So we glue on a disc to get the surface without boundary, S prime. So we have that the Euler characteristic of S prime is equal to zero. And using our formula, formula for genus now, we get that two minus two, the genus of S is equal to our Euler characteristic. And we know this is zero. So if we rearrange our terms, we get this equality and we get the genus of S is equal to one. So the trefoil Seyfert surface has genus one. So it actually, it doesn't look like it, but it's, this means it's homeomorphic to a torus with a single disc removed. And in fact, this sort of algorithm for determining the genus of the Seyfert surface works for any construction of a surface using Seyfert's algorithm. So you just take one, subtract the amount of discs and add the amount of bands and divide it by two. Yeah, yeah, I know, a donut appears in the trefoil knot. Like, whoa, it, it looks so weird, right? It's like this weird surface with disks and bands and weird stuff, but it turns out it's, it's just a donut with a hole removed. So that's really cool. And uh, we performed a safe algorithm on alternating projections of the trefoil knot and the figure eight knot. So we know we must have their minimal genus safe for surfaces. So we know that the minimal genus for the trefoil knot is one. And from our construction of the figure eight knot, that was a slide ago, don't worry if you don't remember it too much, we did use three bands and 
we deduce three disks and four bands. So by this formula, we have that the figure eight dot must be of genus one. Uh, but this warning, this does not mean it's equal to the trefoil. If two knots have the same, have a same invariant, that does not mean they go in the same basket. The invariant only helps us to, uh, differentiate between different knots. So two knots can be different, but have some of the same invariants. But if two knots disagree on invariant, then they're not the same knot. And we also have the following theorem, a knot K is the unknot if and only if it has minimal genus zero. We already know it bounds a disk, so it must have minimal genus zero, but the other direction is a bit more complicated, so I won't go into this here. And another example is this, this six two knot, and as an exercise, you can compute the secret service for this. And we can conclude this knot actually has genus suit two. So GK for this is equal to two. Yeah, it, it is really pretty. I like it. It has a really nice sacred surface here too. Uh, so it has minimal genus two, so it must be distinct from the trefoil and the figure eight knot and the unknot. So we've sorted these into baskets. So hopefully this gives an idea of how we would use our invariant to distinguish between different knots. Finally, we're going to improve, uh, prove a really important theorem. And that's uh, that the genus is additive over the knot sum. So the genus of the knot sum of two knots K1 and K2 is equal to the genus of K1 and the genus of K2. And this is how we're gonna actually show that we can't take two knots, two non-trivial knots and get the unknot. So we're gonna prove this. So the first proof is that the genus of the knot sum of K1 and K2 is less than or equal to this. So this part of the proof is really simple. We just take two minimal genus safer surfaces, S1 and S2 for our knots K1 and K2. And we join these surfaces through a single band. So we create a safer surface for the knot sum. And we know this is the safer surface for the knot sum because, well, it's just the two knots, the two surfaces with the knots as their boundary, then we connect it through a band. So that's normally how we take the knot sum anyways. So, and I'll show you in this little picture. So we just connect these two minimal genus safer surfaces through a band. And this will give us a surface that is equal that has equal genus to these two surfaces. But it is conceivable that there could be another process that creates a minimal genus safer surface that is smaller for the knot sum. And we're going to show actually that this isn't the case. Okay, so we're going to consider a minimal genus safer surface for the knot sum. And because this because this is a composite knot, uh, we can consider a twice punctured sphere F that separates it into the K1 part and the K2 part. So if I had, for example, if I had two sacred surfaces, I'm just going to draw this out really quickly. Uh, if I had two sacred surfaces, if, if I had a sacred surface for this knot sum, I'll just draw it out right here. I have a sphere that sort of surrounds the one knot, and it will only intersect the boundary at the points we took in the knot sum. So maybe an info, maybe the graphic on here might make it more clear. So we have this twice punctured sphere F that will just surround one part of our knot. And the only part it intersects the boundary of the knot is the part of the knot sum. And again, you can sort of see it separates uh, our knot into two parts. So it separates into two arcs. We have the alpha one arc. So we'll call this alpha one and we'll call this arc alpha two we'll call this alpha two. And the arc in between, so the arc where we separated the not sum part, we'll call this beta. And if we union alpha one with beta, we get back our first knots. We get back, so alpha one union beta is just our first knot because we're just taking the part we cut off and putting it back on. And likewise, alpha two union beta is our second knot. So yeah, as I just stated here, that's just what we went over. So in the outside, so in the outside of the sphere, we have the, the K2 part. And in the inside of the sphere, we have the K1 part. And we want to construct a surface that F cleanly divides it into K1 and K2 along beta. The only problem is we might have other weird pathological uh, intersections. Like for example, on this one, we have this weird doohickey that's sort of coming out. We have this intersection. And this is no good because we it it's ambiguous, right? We want this to just cleanly divide it into a safer surface for K1 and a safer surface for K2. Uh, 
So first we're going to isotope the Seyfert surface and the sphere so that we don't have any single point intersections. And this is called putting the surfaces in general position. So we're just separating it so we don't have any singularities, so to speak. So now the only part, the only interest kind of intersections we'll have are just the curve beta. So we have beta and then we'll have loops and they might be nested, but that's okay. And we can only have one intersection curve because the sphere only intersects the, the knot boundary at the part taken in the knot sum. So next to remove, we want to remove these intersection loops because we don't like them. So in topology and especially topology on manifolds in higher dimensions too, it's very common to use surgery techniques and surgery is just a controlled way we have of modifying a surface taking it apart in a controlled way so we know the result, so we can sort of control the result. So we're going to consider an innermost intersection loop on uh, the intersection of S and K, so the innermost one. So there might be nested ones, but we want to take them apart in a fashion that takes the innermost one out first and then the other ones out after. So we're going to cut our surface along this intersection curve. And I'll, there will be an, uh, a picture on the next slide that will show more what this means. And when we cut this surface along these two parts, it's gonna, there's gonna be a hole or like a, a boundary component in it. And that's not good. So we're gonna attach disks D1 and D2 along C to both parts of the surface. So along C is the loop we cut. So I'll show you what this means on the next slide. So we cut this surface and we have these parts that are now begging to have a disc glued onto them because it's like a surgery. You gotta put back what you took away. So we glue disks onto the parts we removed. So notice that this, this process doesn't include any part of the boundary because we're only removing the intersection loops. So the new S that results is still gonna be a safe service for the not sum, or it's gonna contain a safe service for the not sum. So this, you might think, okay, well, this surgery could result in a surface that is disconnected. And that's no good for us, right? We don't want our surface to be disconnected because then part of it doesn't bound the knot, but it actually turns out that this, so actually, sorry. So actually I should back up there. So no, so actually it turns out the, the surface we get cannot be connected from this process. So actually when we do the surgery, one of these parts must be thrown away because if it was connected, well, we just added on two disks. Disks have only the characteristic of one. So we would have a contradiction because we just, we just, increase the other characteristic and that lowers the genus. So then our S is not a minimal genus favorite surface, but we assumed it was. So this new surface created through surgery cannot be connected. So since it's not connected, there must be another, there must be two connected components we created. So we just throw away the one that isn't bounded by the, the, um, the not K1 connect K2. And doing this finitely many times, uh, this should be, by the way, this is a typo, this should be F, cleanly divides S into K1 and K2. But doing this finitely many times, because there can only be finitely many intersection loops, we got rid of all the pathological intersections. We get, um, we would get, uh, we would get um, a surface that is divided into a safer surface for K1 and a safer surface for K2. And it's just cleanly divided through beta. So this is our beta that's still here. There's no intersection loops. No, no pathologies, it's just divided into a safer service for K1, so for K1 and K2. And there's no other intersections. And these safer surfaces, so the safer surfaces right here, these are not necessarily minimal. So these are not necessarily minimal. So we don't know that these are minimal safer surfaces. We just know that they are safer surfaces. So these are just, so these would be an S2, S1 for K1 and K2. So we know that because we can create, we can do surgery on our K1 and K2 surface to get something that's divided into safer surfaces for K1 and K2, but these aren't necessarily minimal, then this has to be greater than or equal to the sum of the minimal genus of K1 and K2. So here's some other results that follow immediately from this theorem. We know now that the unknot cannot be the sum of any two non-trivial knots. So let's assume that it can. So let's assume that there is two non-trivial knots that give us the unknot. Well, then from a result, we would have that the genus of the unknot is simply equal to the genus of the knots that make it up. 
And what we'd have that it's equal to the sum of the genus because we know genus is additive from our theorem. And this can't equal zero. This cannot equal zero because this cannot equal zero because it's non-trivial and we know only the trivial knot uh, can have genus zero. And likewise, this cannot equal zero. So that so this can't equal zero, but that's a contradiction because we know the minimal genus of the unknot must be zero. So the unknot cannot be the sum of any two non-trivial knots. And we have another theorem. If the genus of k equals one, then k is a prime knot. So we're going to assume that k, so let's assume that k is a knot that has genus one and it's equal to the knot sum of k1 and k2. But then we would have that g of k is equal to g of the knot sum of k1 and k2. We know the knot sum is additive, but we know the genus of k is equal to one. Well, then that implies that either k1 is the unknot or k2 is the unknot because, well, only the unknot has genus zero and we need one of these to have genus zero. Otherwise, the sum cannot be one. So k, if k is genus one, then it must be a prime knot. So we know that the trefoil and the figure eight knot, because we found their genus before, they're both prime knots. So that's really great. So using surfaces, we were able to determine properties about prime knots and the unknots. I find that really beautiful. Two fields of math you think like wouldn't have any connections at all end up being super important to one another. So we also have this theorem that every knot is the finite sum of prime knots, and this just follows from what we proved previously, and the knot sum being the the genus of a knot being additive. So eventually we're going to get down to something that has genus one. And finally, the conclusion for this talk. So so not only have we found a useful invariant for differentiating between different knots, but we've also managed to prove important theorems about knot theory and prime knots. And it really shows that, oh, well, here's two like really different fields of math. We have knot theory and surfaces and they're sort of connected through topology, but like what, what sort of connection could they have? But it actually turns out the, 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 the surface topology was super helpful in our investigation of knot theory. And I just find that really beautiful. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Um, here are some farther reading. So I really like, so if you're, if you're not really like super knowledgeable in math yet, I think uh, The Knot Book by Colin Adams is a really good read. I, I also like the uh, Matt A. Andrews lecture series for knot theory. Uh, it's a really good lecture series. So I highly recommend watching that. Um, and if you want something a little more rigorous on knot theory, uh, Licorice has a really good book on it. It does require some algebraic topology background, so you would need a, a bit, a lot more background for that. And if you want to like actually learn the rigorous theory of topology, Moncrez is always a great book. It's it's a classic book. So if you want to like actually learn the rigorous theory about topology and maybe this got you a little interested, I would recommend that textbook. And here are my references. And that's it. That's my talk. So. Hopefully everyone enjoyed. Thank you. So I would recommend that everybody please 